It is such a massive and complex and kind of diverse set of issues that touches almost everything that I think it can be really overwhelming to go and say, I want to work on climate and sustainability and then try and figure out what the heck to do next. We're going to be talking about sustainability today, so that's exciting. So office hours, you guys are probably familiar since you've been here before, but basically we just cover relevant topics for founders within the Shopify ecosystem, really focusing mainly on marketing. So our goal is for everyone here to find value in today's discussion. And we've brought three, I would say, pretty impressive people, not including myself. Actually, just kidding. Just one impressive person right here on, on screen. But I like these guys a lot. I run Darkroom and we invest in businesses and we grow Shopify brands mainly uh, across Amazon, across D2C, um, across retail as well. Today, we're focusing on sustainable businesses, brands that are really doing good for the environment and for the planet. And we've got Daniel, Taras, and Chad. They each have three businesses in this space. Daniel is on the VC side at Gather. Uh, Taras is running and the founder and lead designer of Tarform. And then Chad is uh, the founder and CEO at Rosie. Um, I'm gonna have them each introduce themselves. And guys, just pass around the mic. Um, Daniel, if you could start and just tell us a little bit more about Gather and the work that you guys do. Sure. Yeah. Daniel Mafazzoli here. I'm a principal at Gather Ventures. We are a sort of boutique VC that invests in the health of humans and the planet. We are operating out of our first fund, mostly in the plant-based ecosystem, um, and working on our second fund that's going to be a little bit more expansive and focus on sort of three pillars of wellness investing, one being human sort of physical wellness, the other being mental and then environmental. Okay. Yeah, so let's, all, let's gather. Daniel, gather is awesome. Taurus is uh, the CEO and founder of Tarform. It's an EV motorcycle business. I'm doing your intro for you, but tell us more about uh, Thanks. <laughs> we make electric motorcycles also made out of plants, which is uh, not how we started, but uh, we kind of organically sprout in. So we began about seven years ago, and uh, the idea was basically how do we make electric mobility sustainable and uh, beautiful? And how do we get more people excited about uh, maybe using less of their internal combustion engines, but also ride motorcycles? That is a pretty cool experience, in my opinion. I would agree. If you, if anyone is in Brooklyn, you got to check out their office in the New York. You can see some of these beautiful machines. Uh, Chad, tell us about Rosie. Hey everybody, I'm excited to be here. Um, My name is Shev Sura. I'm the founder and CEO of Rosie Soil. We create a sustainable, peat-free potting soil. So it's for houseplants, cacti and succulent and uh, seedling. And then we're working on some exciting new products as well. Um, but I got really excited about it because we basically found a way to turn captured CO2 into a higher performance soil, which means that every product that we make and sell actually pulls CO2 out of the air and does so in a way that doesn't ask consumers to compromise on the performance of the product, which is, I think, key to really scaling an impact for a mission-driven company. So yeah, excited to share more about that. We're going to dive right into it. So Chad, let's just start with you. What prompted you to get into green or climate-focused startups? Yeah, I mean, there were kind of two paths to it. So I, uh, I grew up in Chicago, and I lived with my grandma, and she was a big gardener. So I've been a gardener literally my entire life. I actually asked for potting soil for Christmas when I was three years old and got a giant pile of dirt under the Christmas tree, <laughs> basically. And so I've been a consumer in that space for a long time and, you know, was one of the kind of, just kind of realized that most of the brands were not speaking to the things that I cared about, despite, you know, gardening being America's number one hobby and people that are gardeners obviously caring deeply about sustainability and, and nature and sustainability and all that good stuff. And then the kind of other path that brought me into specifically climate focused startups is I built and sold a food delivery company when I was in college. So I caught the entrepreneurship bug super early. And um, while the experience was amazing, I got basically burnt out on lack of purpose or mission. Um, I just didn't care that much about delivering food to people. And so I knew I wanted to start another company, but I knew it needed to be kind of more meaningful, more impactful felt more fulfilling for me to spend tons and tons of time building it. And I got totally obsessed with the climate side of things and then carbon capture and sort of found a way to combine my love for gardening and my desire to work on something in back. Honestly, Taurus, that sounds really similar to your path too, just in terms of 
your love for design. Can you take us through that? Oh. Yeah, I spent most of my career in product design development technology. I grew up in Sweden, uh, which is, I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, sustainability, they sort of got it down, where you, if you don't toss your you know, plastic bottle, do the whole sort of crime, like what's going on? You put it in the wrong bit. So in the uh, Scandinavian culture, you kind of grow up with this uh, inherent sense of responsibility and I would say slightly more awareness where our things come from or what happens to them end of life. The United States has a little bit more to uh, catch up on that front. And I think most of it comes from education simply. It's not a priority to teach people, you know, what is waste, what is petroleum and the, all the stuff that ends up in the landfill. So for me, it wasn't like, oh, I need to be sustainable. It was more... Like, well, yeah, is there another option? So when we started Tarform, and I spent a lot of the time in a dusty shop in Brooklyn trying to sort of revive uh, vintage motorbikes. And uh, when you work with toxic materials, like uh, toxic paints and primers, and you get home and, you know, your skin is just not good. And uh, my ex is like, dude, what the hell? You're just stinking this oil and gas. At that point, the first question was like, well, why are we still making things with these outdated and toxic materials? Surely it's got to be a better way to, to construct things. So that became more of an exploration, less than a value that we have to be sustainable. Where we started saying, well, is there a way for us to displace petroleum-based plastics in our manufacturing process? And then basically went through a long prototyping round and found this guy that was making surfboards out of flaxseed in Australia that seemed to be a pretty good alternative to, uh, uh, to plastics. And then we started making prototypes. And then from then on, it sort of started evolving. And, you know, one question led to another. It's like, well, if we can replace this, why can't we replace that? And so it was less from, you know, having like, this is our sustainability policy on the website. But it was more driven from an intrinsic, uh, intrinsic motivation to, to make products that are a little bit healthier, I guess. Yeah, it just made sense, I guess, for that product development cycle, like in, for what you were doing. And it sounds similar, Chad, where, you know, you mentioned the product really works and it's actually better, but it also has this really beneficial component of it. How long did that take for you to find? I mean, I mean, like, was it part of the, the, the purpose? It was certainly part of the purpose. It was, I mean, version one of the product was certainly not better. It probably took a year of constant iteration to get to the point where we could compete with soil that's basically jacked up with chemical and synthetic fertilizers because those make plants grow really fast, but are terrible for the actual health of the plants and the environment. But yeah, I mean, we just, we knew from the beginning that the product had to be better to get people to buy it. And so focused diligently on iteration to get there. Daniel, I want you to answer this question too, just for, for those of you who don't know, Daniel's background is in venture and in VC and Gather's obviously exclusively focused on uh, products that are good for the environment. So tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, sure. So uh, my background in is entirely in sort of better for you venture capital, particularly angled on sort of human health outcomes. But what we've noticed over the years, right, is that it doesn't really matter what you do for your own body or mind if the environment that you're living in is not livable, right? And so I think that's something that we've been really hyper-focused on the past couple of years of, of how we can kind of bridge that gap between what's healthy for humans and what's healthy for the environment. Um, because there are certain products out there right now that are really good for the environment in spite of human health and vice versa. Um, and so that's sort of what's driven our focus on green and climate, you know, focused startups and sustainable startups um, is sort of figuring out that intersection between things that are good for the planet and good for you as well. And in the plant-based world, there is thankfully a lot of overlap there. Um, and it's important to, to kind of really support those businesses that are doing that. So that's sort of the the nexus that we operate within. My personal story was that I was a pre-med student athlete in college and sort of really fine-tuned my understanding of really knowing where things are coming from and the supply chains behind them and and how that can actually make a significant impact on you know your health and the health of everyone around you. So um, it's just a generally important thing for us to be cognizant of as we're moving through our lives. Awesome. How do you weave sustainability into your story in a way that consumers care about? Um, what marketing initiatives have driven the most impact for you in the past two years? So there's two parts to that question. Chad, if you want to go first. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, I mean, we've, we've tested it extensively. To, to be honest, like the, the primary messaging for us, and I think for a lot of brands, still has to be what's in it for the consumer. Like, you still have to kind of win against all your competitors on the things that they're judging your competitors on. But what we found is that when you then sort of layer on a secondary or a third level of messaging that connects what's in it for the consumer with either your own company values or showing that you care about something in the community or show that you care about sustainability, that's, I think, what really sort of can push you over the edge in the consumer mindset. And especially, I mean, we think a lot about in a retail, most of our business is, is actually on shelf in retail, and you have like two seconds to win on shelf. And so we've gone super deep on basically how do we connect, yeah, that primary messaging around for us, it's performance with some of the kind of deeper things that the company is thinking about and do it at a level that, you know, most people can sort of understand and access. Like, for example, we used to talk a lot about carbon because our product sequesters carbon. First of all, sequester is a terrible word and most people have kind of a high level understanding of carbon, but don't, you know, it's this very like ephemeral thing. So we've moved sort of back from that and gone harder on our sourcing and our ingredients and the fact that it's a living soil. And again, it's like, how do you connect the things that the consumers care about with kind of the deeper mission of the company? And then marketing initiatives, you know, there's been a lot of different stuff. I would say the early win is I, because I actually know nothing about soil, I've learned it all kind of since starting the company. So I hired, our first hire was someone who is way smarter than me in all of this stuff. And he happened to be a TikTok influencer talking about basically soil health. And um, so he had, I think like 300,000 TikTok followers. And that I think really helped jumpstart getting him to start talking about all the things that he cared about and the research that he was doing connected to this company. I think one gave us a lot of like trust in the gardening community, but also helped get the brand initially out there. Okay, so your, was that, that was your first hire, you said? So it was a marketing hire focused on? No, he's, he's our lead soil researcher. Like he, <laughs> he runs our soil lab and happens to be on the side a big TikTok influence. Interesting, so does he have any <laughs> hand in marketing? <laughs> yeah. Does he run Sprizzy marketing? No, no, okay. yeah. He's very busy like in our soil lab. I was like, two birds, one stone. In the early days he did, but now he's got. It. It's very funny because most of the brands we talk to, they still haven't figured out organic TikTok or reels and they're usually missing that hire. Mm -hmm. So he probably yeah. could double. Yeah. And he knows how to communicate with creators too, because he is a creator. Uh, really quick, can you describe to us like biochar and the, two, the one minute scientific process of it for those who, who don't necessarily know? Yeah, so at a, at a very high level, in order to achieve net zero, we have to do massive emissions reduction, but there will be certain sectors of the economy that are really hard to get to zero via emissions reduction alone, which means to basically make the equation work, you have to start taking excess CO2 out of the environment. That for a long time has been kind of the ugly stepchild of, of the climate kind of conversation, people put it in this weird category with like geoforming and trying to change the planet and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, I, the IPCC, most scientists agree that to get to net zero, we have to pull CO2 out of the air. The leading way to do that today is this really weird kind of cult-like soil amendment called biochar. Oh. It has, we've been using it in farming for 2000 years because it does amazing things when you add it to soil. And recently we discovered the process of making it is actually net carbon negative. And the way that that works is basically plants in the process of doing photosynthesis pull CO2 out of the air. Plants are mostly carbon. The problem is when they die or are allowed to decompose or are burned, they release most of that carbon as CO2. If you convert the plants into biochar, you basically fix that carbon in the material and remove it from the carbon cycle. So for every ton of biochar that you produce, you pull about three tons of CO2 out of the carbon cycle and fix it for hundreds of years in that material. And so you get, again, that win-win of better soil performance because it's an amazing agricultural input along with this really important kind of carbon story. Great explanation. Give us the type of impact that you think this business could have on, on the environment, you know, at scale. Well, we're tiny right now. I mean, but <laughs> I'm aware, I know, I know. But I'm just like, give us an idea, even if it's just a small idea. Yeah, so for context, we're, we're we actually turned two today on Earth Day. We have sequestered 100 tons of CO2 in that time, which is about as much as an average American 
emits in a year, so it's not that much, but it's, you know, it's scaling quickly and the kind of larger impact that we hope to have is by scaling awareness and demand for this input called biochar, which will have serious, serious impact on climate and is expected to be, you know, about 10%-ish of the total carbon capture kind of story, which ends up being really big kind of crazy numbers. Unbelievable. Taris, let's go to you. First one or second? Let's do both. I love the phone. I'll, I'll be short. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you it's allergies were hitting you today. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. How do you weave sustainability into this? Right, let's do the first one because marketing hasn't been an issue for Taurus. And if you see the bike, it like sells itself. Let's talk about the first for now. The way we look at sustainability. No, I think it's for, I'll help you out. Yeah, no, I got it. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things we believe in, all these Apple ads come from my idea. We worked really hard to bring Sorry. Um, <laughs> so what we're building is a highly technological product, right? And technology is inherently, um, it has shorter lifespan. It's uh, obsolescent, right? The reason you buy the iPhone every year is not because you have to. It's because the way someone engineered this product, it's engineered to fail at a certain point. And this term called bland obsolescence came about 100 years ago. It comes from the automotive industry where um, the car manufacturers realized that they need to sell more cars and the cars they were building were lasting a little too long and uh, you don't want that right you don't want to sell one product and then for the customer to enjoy it so they started engineering things that were planned to fail at a certain point that does not sound like a story that we should keep you know designing and building new companies and products after if you want to take sustainability seriously so usually we look at sustainability as a technological solution. And we talk about, you know, carbon extraction technologies and electric vehicles and so on, which is great. But the core of sustainability is you use a product for the longest amount of possible because the amount of energy that is required to dig into the earth, extract the minerals to create a product, anything. Like look at whatever you're wearing, even the simplest thing took so much energy and so many people and a global supply chain to produce. And, uh, you know, plastic bottle, we use it for 30 seconds. So a product that has traveled all over the world has a lifespan of 30 seconds to end up in a... Anyway, so uh, what we try to do is how do we move away from technological obsolescence while building a highly technological product? So building it on a modular platform makes sense, which means that you only replace the parts that are failing and in terms of electronics. So. A lot of parts on our bike can last 50, 60 years, just like vintage bikes. You know, if you buy a motorcycle from the 50s, if you take care of it, it still works. If you buy a car from the 50s, if you take care of it, it still works. Why? Because the mindset of the way we were building things back then, the mindset was built to be repaired. Today, we build things to be replaced. And I think we need to go back and start thinking from a perspective of, if I buy something, if I choose that something enters my life, is this a product I want to keep for the next 5, 10, 15 years? And if it is, then inherently it becomes the most sustainable thing because you don't have to buy it over and over and over again. So looking at through that filter, we try to create a product that would last for 50, 60 years, just like a Triumph I worked on that was built in mid-century. And if you do that, well, the, the future will tell if, if that's, if that's going to work. But I think it starts with an intention. And then from then on, you can show us how do you incorporate that into into your company. Yeah, that was a, a, a great answer. So it's more just like making things to last. In your particular case, though, it's an EV motorcycle, which is pretty rare. Give us an under give us a a reference point. How large is how much market share does EV capture in the motorcycle space? For now, uh, non-existent. I would say where the electric two wheel space is today is where Tesla was about ten years ago, where people are like, yeah, cool. There's this electric car, right? Today, like it's no question that electric vehicles is the, is the future. The motorcycle space and in general, the two wheel space is slightly lagging. It's lagging in North America and Europe. If you go to China, 50, 70 million EV scooters were sold in Asia. So over there, it's like, of course, you know, EVs are here to stay uh, because Asia owns the global supply chains when it comes to electric vehicles. The US is just warming up and uh, also, the sort of, sort of the notion of lightweight mobility is not very prevalent in America and Europe more so. If you've been to like Milan or Barcelona, 
you know, scooters, that's kind of how people get around. So I think that there's a lot to be done on, on that front as well. Tanya, um, I want to give you a chance to, to speak on this point for maybe the portfolio companies. Yeah, I think it's definitely a more founder centric question. So I want to give these guys the, the time of day, but uh, I do think that one of the things that they both touched on, um, if you guys picked up on it, is that ultimately the, the product has to speak to consumers sort of full stop, right? They're, you can have a mission, you can have the sustainability factor, but if you're leaning on that alone to win consumers, it's probably not going to be long lasting. And in order to have that stopping power from a product perspective, it needs to be a very good product, period. Regardless of the sustainability element, that is a nice to have in the eyes of consumers right now. Hopefully one day we can all hope that eventually people will become wise to the fact that sustainability should be their primary focus when purchasing a product. But at the end of the day, it might get them to try it, but what gets them to stick around and to have repeat purchases and to be a lifelong consumer of your product and a, and a supporter of your business is going to be the fact that the product stands above all other products that are in that category that you're competing with, right? So that's just something to keep in mind, especially for the founders here. The mission, the mission is important and it's very core to your business. But if your product doesn't win next to all the other products in a lineup every single time, it, it's a valiant effort and you're going to save some trees. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be a you're not going to be a sustainable sustainability focused business, right? You're going to be kind of a flash in the pan. And that's not what we're trying to achieve, right, as founders. So that's just I think it's a really good point. I mean, just to it seems like w winning in a particular category is like a confluence of product. You need to have the best sort of product uh, to win in the space. I would say mission is a part of it, and then marketing too to drive demand and to to win market share. Yeah, for sure. Taurus, I actually want to talk about that too, though, because we mentioned how design has been such a focal point with your marketing strategy. Like you're talking about building a sustainable EV bike, and people actually see it and they just want it, regardless of knowing that it's sustainable or not. Can you talk a little bit more about? You know, how you mentioned your dad. How many people ride motorcycles here? Zero. Yeah, that's kind of, uh, yeah. In, uh, usually it's about two people per hundred. So it's a very small segment of, uh, of humans that uh, want to sit on a machine that goes 80 miles per hour, right, in New York City. <laughs> so you need to belong to a certain subset of, uh, of risk takers. But nonetheless, there's, there seems to be some energy that... Uh, this this machine uh, has where uh, as a product designer of all of the products i've made like this thing is what i chose to dedicate the last six years of my life to because it had it, uh, it encapsulates so many different dimensions of um uh like the physical world it has state-of-the-art engineering you know because of a small footprint you need to figure out a way how to compress the stuff we've created, which is everything from electrical batteries, motor controls, motors, into a compact package, right? It needs to have a, a four factor, the exterior, the aesthetics, the way you look at it. You need to feel something because a motorcycle is not a rational decision. It is purely emotional. So if you don't make it appealing simply by looking at it, you fail already there. And there's a lot of, I think you can all relate whether you like motorcycles or cars. There's certain cars you pass by and you wouldn't, if I would ask you, what was the car you just passed? 99% of cars you wouldn't even reflect, like, oh, Kia, Hyundai, whatever, right? But then you pass by like a 1960s Porsche 911 or a Lamborghini or whatever sports car, right? You, even if you're not into cars, you look over your shoulder like, huh, that's cool. And you can't. So what is that thing that made me look around, right? And we can dig into like the psychology of aesthetics and what defines beauty, whether it's subjective or objective. But there seems to be a layer where we just viscerally react to things that uh, carry an element of, uh, of beauty. And uh, that was uh, basically the pursuit is like, how do, we, how do we identify that? How do we create a shape that speaks for itself? And if we spend more time and effort on that, maybe the marketing will be easier. And uh, I don't remember who said it, uh, one of the marketing guys is like, marketing is an excuse for a bad product and sales is an excuse for bad marketing. So if you're not focusing on the product, if you're not making sure that people are like, holy shit, I want this thing, right? Everything you build on top is probably gonna be a little bit shaky, unless you go back and, and engineer in terms of say, what's the root cause? 
right? Try and figure, figure that out. Let's progress here. Taurus, I'm gonna give you a break. I'm gonna give you a break. Chad, this is actually great for you. So Ch Chad previously, w before Rosie was head of growth at Every Table, that's actually where we met. We worked together um, on agency client side. He knows a lot about marketing. Do you have any contrarian perspectives on the marketing ecosystem in 2024? Hmm. He also, I didn't give these guys the question before. <laughs> yeah, I was told I would get the questions before and I did not question. Um, I mean, I, I think I could kind of tie it back to the genesis of, of Rosie and why I went the direction I went, which is we are very much and purposefully D to C second. Um, we wanted to build a retail first brand. And part of that was a reaction to trying to build an e-commerce brand through iOS 14 and basically banging my head against a wall for a year and burning hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. And I did not want to do that again. I didn't want to kind of rely on that as a channel. I also just felt like retail was a really interesting way to get basically free brand impressions. Like, you know, today we're in over 800 doors across the U.S., including targets. And that means that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are walking past our little kind of packaging billboard every single day, basically for free. I mean, the stores are paying us to hold the product. So I don't know if that's necessarily contrarian in 24. I feel like a lot of brands have started to go that way, but that was certainly the kind of impetus for why we crafted Rosie the way that we did. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely important to think about, I mean, like even form factor when I think about your packaging for, you know, if retail is gonna be the channel that makes the most sense for you to, to think through that. But um, yeah, I think there's a whole generation of direct consumer marketers who are like, oh shit, retail is, is a big thing. If you could give yourself one piece of advice as someone getting started in the sustainability space or in marketing, uh, what would it be and why? Yeah. You could do it. Yeah, so it took me five years to figure out what aspect of climate change I wanted to work on, which I don't know if it has to take someone that long, but it, it definitely is a process. It is such a massive and complex and kind of diverse set of issues that touches almost everything that I think it can be really overwhelming to go and say, I want to work on climate and sustainability and then try and figure out what the heck to do next. And so my first piece of advice would just be really patient with yourself to like figure it out. But my second piece of advice would be to try to connect it as deeply as possible with something that you care about, whether or not that be in sustainability and just find a way to do something that you love even marginally more sustainable. Um, cause I think you'll have greater impact over the long term if, if you're in it and you want to work super hard and you're not going to get really burnt out doing the 80, 90 hour weeks it takes to try to build something. And there's, there's impact to be made literally everywhere. And so find a place that, that you want to work on and figure out how to make it impact. It's a great answer. Taurus, I think you could relate to that. Yeah, I echo it hundred percent. There's a, there's a lot of people, a lot of founders, right? We start with like let's save the world. And, uh, um, the approach usually it's, uh, to be perceived in a certain way, right? You're doing it because, uh, you want to get, uh, you know, credibility points for being sustainable. Most, most of that does not come from the space you actually wanted to come from. And, uh, I'm a big believer that sustainability, like it, it needs to, there needs to be a psychological shift within each person to figure out why, why do I care about this? Do I really care about sustainability or do I care about it because I'm supposed to, because everyone is talking about sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. And that's for each person to uh, ask yourself that question. What do I actually care about? What does sustainability mean to me? Uh, is it to take care of our environment? You know, is it to uh, protect the earth for future generations? It could be uh, tons of different answers, but I would say, yeah, ask yourself the question, why? why, why does it matter to you? And then work your way from uh, out of there, figure out what are you good at? You know, can you combine what you're good at with what the world needs? And then maybe somewhere in the middle, uh, is worth exploring because if, uh, if, uh, there comes a time where you're like, oh man, I don't want to do this and sustainability doesn't really matter. So hundred percent to what you said. So Daniel, I think from an investor perspective, like you talk to, how many brands do you talk to a month? Oh, a month? Yeah, dozens. Um, but we have, I mean, we have 13 portfolio companies right now that are all kind of in the 
on average, probably sub seven million in revenue. Um, so we're, we're dealing with founders who are first time founders who are a year into their journey or veteran founders who are three years into their fourth company because the other three failed miserably, right? So it's like, there's a, a lot of what these two guys are saying is, is perfectly on point, right? You have to be, you have to be super passionate about what you're engaging with um, and allow yourself the time and the, the space to learn about yourself and about the business and about the sector. Um, and I think, you know, the, in, in terms of the sustainability element, um, I think as Tara said, right, like you need to know what it is that drives you within the sustainability question and how you want to operate within that ecosystem, right? Um, whether it is, you know, water treatment or EV or soil or carbon sequestering in other forms and fashions, right? Um, recyclable containers, uh, things like that, right? There, there are all sorts of avenues to go down. Um, but ultimately, if it's in an area or within a product set that you're not super passionate about already to begin with, or that you don't have some unique perspective on, it's going to be very hard to be working those long hours um, and really, you know, gritting and bearing it for the journey. And so I think what they're saying is, you know, I would heed their advice. Um, and we, you know, we stand on the VC side. We're a pretty operationally focused fund in general in terms of our strategy. And so a lot of these conversations are ones that we have with founders on a daily basis of like, how are we thinking about this? Is the, you know, is the consumer resonating with your product right now in terms of how you're marketing it with respect to the sustainability angle? Or should we just be marketing it straight up as a consumer product and they realize after the fact that, oh, this, this product is actually good for the environment and good for me, I'm going to come back for more now, right? So a lot of these questions kind of are pretty fluid conversations that you should always be checking in with yourself and or your co-founders and or anyone on your team and other advisors um, and really leaning on that support system that you might have as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the advice I'd give. I think it's really interesting that we have both the venture side of things here and the entrepreneurs because both of these companies, right, that here are venture backed. And I think you guys, you know, some of these businesses require a lot of funding to actually bring some of these products to market. And that process in and of itself is incredibly debilitating. Um, and you need to be like committed to whatever your company is. Um, I'd like for you guys both to talk about that and then Daniel for you to respond being on the other side uh, and kind of writing the check. But, you know, I think most of the people in this crowd have probably thought about raising venture or are considering it or have done it. Since you guys are on the other side, give us a, a, a take of what that looked like. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it kind of goes to what we were just saying, which is it very much depends on who you are and what you want out of the business and ultimately like what you want your lifestyle to be running that business. So the, the venture route is really purposefully designed to be super hard because <laughs> they want you to grow as fast as humanly possible um, with as little capital as humanly possible. And you know, we made the choice to go that route because frankly, I wanted the pressure to try to, you know, a thousand or 10,000 X the impact of Rosie or, or frankly fail trying. I mean, that's, that's the venture model. Um, it does not make my nights and weekends super fun, but that's what I kind of wanted to sign up for and feel like I'm in the life stage to, to do that. But it's, it, it, it makes it really challenging to try to grow that, that quickly. Um, and I think it really is, I think it's kind of no offense, but kind of overrated. Like I think, I think more people should consider not doing it and building a business around the lifestyle that they want. And then if you are ready to try to, you know, pour kerosene on it, like go for it. Cause it is, it's also super fun. How long has it been? Two years? Yeah, we've done two, right? We did a pre-seed and a seed. Nice. Taurus, reply to that. Um, yeah, I agree with all of that. And we've been pretty much raising capital since day one. That's a, a, a other halftime job, right? And the venture model is amazing because it has allowed so many people with a, just a napkin sketch to get funded and bring amazing things. I, I don't think there's other venue to get funded. 
But then somewhere in somewhere there, the whole venture model kind of got caught in its own tail, and it became sort of an accelerating spiral where, in order to hold the model, you just need to write bigger and bigger checks on very little evidence that this is actually going to be a company that's going to succeed. And I think if anyone's been raising funding in the last two years, uh, it hasn't been flowing like rivers, right? Because a lot of venture capital realized like, oh shit, the investments we've made are not into companies that are actually creating value. They haven't figured out their fundamentals and their business model, and neither have we. You know, so the one big thing we've been doing in the last year is like, okay, if we can't get venture funding, let's go back to 101 and building a company. You know, how do we make profit on the thing that we actually sell? And just, you know, tenaciously starting looking at what would this look like if we were not relying on external funding? And I think it's a exercise that very few entrepreneurs do, mainly because capital has been uh, accessible fairly easily. And whether you can get venture capital or you can get a grant or you can get a check from anyone, my biggest recommendation would be like, go and understand the basics of your business, numbers. And a lot of founders, like, yeah, later, I'll figure out later how I'm gonna make money. Out. Mm, start with a napkin sketch. I didn't do that. I relied on like, oh, hundred million dollars, you know, EVs are left and right. And now we gotta sort of go back and do the whole work we should have done a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, just, you know, the one-on-one of trading, building companies. I, I want to, uh, I mean, I, this is a, a conversation for another time, but, uh, Daniel, I want to talk about like how you actually built a motorcycle, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, well, yeah, no, I'm going to, I'm going to leave before Chad beats me up because he's, he's a little bit bigger than me, but. Uh, no, I think everything everything that they've said, sorry, I'm, I'm Italian, I talk with my hands, so my mic control is very poor. Or every, but um, I, <laughs> I, I think everything that they said is, first and foremost, entirely true. Our, you know, and any investor's model that's not sort of an angel investor or high net worth individual that's, you know, supporting a company out of passion is going to come with a lot of weight and gravity and newfound structure and sort of, you know, as soon as a, vestor, a, a venture investor comes into play, the stakes just got raised substantially, right? Because you're, they're managing other people's money and now you're using their money to grow your business. And so everyone has a really, really high level of intensity around succeeding. Um, failure is a huge part of startups, is a huge part of my job as an investor. Um, we don't get decisions right all the time, no one does. And so I think the key, if you are looking for venture funding, is to find the right partner that you actually get along with and you want to work with day in and day out. Um, because at the end of the day, the goal should be, if, you're go if your business needs that capital to grow substantially to a place that you want to get it to, right? you want to get it there, not them. Don't listen to an investor, listen to yourself. There's nothing wrong with starting a business with the intent of growing it to a place where you're making 10, 15% EBITDA margins and paying yourself and your family and, and your co-founders off of that. And you have a nice sustainable business and, and that's your story, right? That is, that is incredibly commendable. I think we should all just sort of like establish that as a, as our grounding, right? And then if you do want to take it to a place where we're talking, you know, nine figure exits, super high growth, high velocity, really high impact or die trying as Chad mentioned, right? Like that's when the discussion for bringing outside institutional capital comes into play. And you just have to be aware of the risks and potential, you know, sort of outcomes there. Um, but it's really, the key is finding the right partner, right? Every investor, every VC fund has different style of approach, has a different strategy that they're trying to employ, has a different check size or deal structure that they usually are most comfortable operating within. And so finding that fit is all part of your job as a founder. Um, and, and you don't want to, you don't want to be in a position where you're making a decision based on something that you think you should be doing. And it's not something that you actually want to be doing as a founder, right? And that's something that's very important, that level of mindfulness. And occasionally, I mean, I see it day to day in, you know, in my seat where we'll have founders that are coming in, they've got, you know, a $2 million business. They're trying to raise $3 million to grow. 
And to Taurus's point, they're losing money on every piece of product that they sell. And they're like, oh, well, eventually we'll get economies of scale and our business will start making money. And, and it's, that's just not, that's not the position you want to be in because you're going to constantly be having to return back to the well. And you're going to start to feel like you're doing something that you, you're rely, you're too heavily reliant on other sources of, in, of funding and the business isn't structured properly to be able to succeed as a standalone unit, right? Um, and that's where you get caught in that spiral of venture capitalists coming in and you start, you know, you have a down round so you can raise more money so you can work on product innovation. And then eventually you need to raise a debt structure because, you know, something goes wrong in the supply chain and now you have $2 million of debt that can take over your entire business if you don't succeed and you're stuck in a, in a blender, right? And we, you know, that's just not a fun place to be in. For people um, even for investors it's not fun because we want you all to succeed as founders and we get put in a position where now we have to make the right call for our investors and if push comes to shove and i have a you know a two million dollar convertible debt that's coming due and the business isn't where it needs to be we have to we have to make the best deal for our fund to manage our investors money we have a like a legal responsibility to do that and eventually the the division between the team as us as your investment partner it starts to become more and more you know us versus you and that's never a fun place to be in for anyone um and so that's i think the advice that i would give founders particularly on the early stage side is just make sure that you're approaching it you've built a business that's sustainable with or without outside capital because that means you have good unit economics you have good margins you've built a sustainable business and then decide what it is that you want to do and how you want the business to grow and, and at what rate and to where, and then move from there. Yeah, there's so many, so many critical, I think, foundational business pieces in there. Basically, you wanna set the business up for scale, you know, and be good whether or not you have venture dollars or, or, or not. Tell us, and Daniel, we'll actually stay with you here. So some of the different companies that you're, you've invested in, they're, trying to take market share from incumbents that you know have totally different value propositions from a climate or sustainability perspective what are some of the conversations you have with those founding teams and some of the tactics that you use to uh win market share yeah that's a good question um i think again i'm going to sound like a broken record but it comes down to the product um especially if we're if we're talking mostly consumer product companies here you know i think a good example and a bad like a, a bad example would honestly be probably beyond meat is a pretty interesting case study in this um again this is goes back to my point about focused on sustainability first in spite of human health or in spite of product quality they've they've taken that on the chin lately um in terms of creating a product that's environmentally friendly with a mission to take animals out of the supply chain for ethical and environmental purposes, sustainable, sustainability focused, but the product wasn't good enough to compete against real meat. And a product also probably wasn't healthy enough to compete against the health aspects of ground beef. Um, and what happened was, was that consumers would have a lot of one-time trial and they'd, they'd try the product out of curiosity or out of sustainability and it wasn't good enough, right? A good example of this is Olipop, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that product. Um, they've, they created a product that tastes at a like uncanny similarity to Coke, Sprite, whatever you want to call it, um, to the point at which now, now they can win on the actual mission of the brand and the actual benefits of the product, right? Because you have people who are Coke drinkers who are like, oh, this is interesting. Let me try this. Oh, wow. This tastes just like a, a really good cola. And then now they're hooked and they're like, what, what is this? Oh, it's got nine grams of prebiotic fiber. Okay, cool. And now you're in, right? You've got the consumer hooked. And again, the, the sort of differentiation and the thing that's gonna pull market share away was after the consumer had actually tried the product. And so the quality there really matters when you're going up against massive incumbents. You have to catch their eye and then win them in a head-to-head -head battle with whatever the, the product or service might be, right? Um, I think it's probably similar in both of your cases, right? With the with soil, you you have to be as good or better than Scott's in from a performance perspective. If gardeners are gonna use rosy soil 
and they plant their they plant their you know tulip bulbs and then it doesn't grow as well as if they use scots they're not going to give a crap if it's sustainable right because they want their flowers to look good that's most people operate in that way there's going to be a small portion that will use it regardless right but you're not trying to win them because you've already got them um and so i think that's that's the key on like sort of calculus that you have to do when you're dealing with these kind of product sets um, and with large sort of bold incumbents in particular. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think from a marketing perspective, uh, it's so much easier to market a really good product. You end up like taking the perspective of I'm generating demand, I'm introducing like an Easter egg, something that people really should know about. Um, and that's predicated on just having a great product. And we did uh, a commercial campaign for Olipop mm -hmm. and the whole campaign was about, you know, this new better for you soda that is something pe everyone should know about yeah. because it's just such a functional benefit, such a better choice for the consumer. And it also tastes really good. Yeah, exactly. If, it, if, if people saw that marketing, went mm -hmm. and tried the product and it tasted like crap, it would, the marketing wouldn't have worked, right? Cause it's this weird kind of chicken and egg situation, but it all comes down to what's in the can at the end of the day. So, um, Chad, what do you think about this one? Yeah. I mean, just one kind of funny aside for our weird industry, which is pretty much all potting soil is made from this input called peat moss, which is made by mining peat bogs, which hold more carbon than the earth's forests. It's like 3% of land mass and 20% of the stored carbon. And it contributes the like extraction of peat bogs contributes to about 5% of total global emissions. Like it's twice as bad as the airline industry and the entire gardening industry is totally reliant on this terrible input. Most people don't know about that. So we've been very like loud and proud peat free. And that's gotten us into some tr kind of fun trouble, I suppose. Um, we got like a cease and desist letter from the Canadian peat association telling us to I mean, basically like shut the F up. Um, <laughs> we go to trade shows with all of these people and I've had many come up to me and kind of just like laugh or swear in my face because of us telling people what's in traditional potting soil. So um, I don't know, I kind of think it's like fun and a little bit like, uh, I don't know, makes for some healthy competition. And, you know, clearly this is something we should be talking about if people are this emotional about it, so. Um, just one question on that before we get to Taurus. How do you weave, like, are you educating your consumers about that? And how are you doing that? Yeah, definitely. Um, we are trying the paraben free route. I don't even actually know what parabens are, but I don't want them in my shampoo. So, and we're kind of going the same route, like just loud and proud peat free, just to kind of trigger curiosity and say, well, if they're putting it on their packaging, it must, it must be something I don't want. In my nice. Taurus. <laughs> Thank you. I've been reflecting, what industry are we competing with? The uh, petroleum? The, I mean, the oil industry? No, let's, let's, let's consider narrow it down. <laughs> yeah, let's narrow it down. Mm, motorcycle industry? Yeah, let's try that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Harley Davidson specific for the, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I guess initially it's just, uh, maybe there's two phases to it. Uh, like during the creative phase, when you work on something. I think it's useful not to pay attention to your competitors because it distracts you. And if you start playing this game of like the positioning chart, where do I fit in into the market landscape? You kind of, it's so easy to get lost in because the very origin, why you're doing it begins to fade away. At least for me, like the first two years, I had no idea what other electric motorcycles existed. And people ask me like, don't you know your competitors? I'm like, nope, I don't care. Because if I allow myself to start mapping out, Maybe I'm not going to honor the real thing that I want to build here. Now, luckily, after we built it and we kind of showed the world that oh, we've made this, um, it was strong enough to stand on its own. And then I begin looking like, OK, what moves the needle? And then you begin developing a feedback loop with what you're doing and how the world responds. And I think just like any natural process as a biofeedback loop, right? Um, same thing in the startup, the more, the faster you can create the feedback loop, meaning you do something, how does the world respond? Reflect over it, incorporate it, iterate it and do it. And then you begin to have a conversation or a relationship between your product and the people you're building it with and your competitors, because your competitors are going to be doing the exactly same thing. 
And the funny thing, we, when we started doing plant-based materials a couple of years ago, uh, New York Times wrote an article, a, a motorcycle made out of pineapples. Uh, most people probably never heard of a motorcycle made out of pineapples, right? But that was a yeah, tension worthy headline for in their perspective, right? Um, it, is the bike made out of pineapple? <laughs> this, we tried the, we tried pineapple at the, on the seat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Cause, um, <laughs> It's a fast thing. We would want to ride a, a pineapple 100 miles an hour. I guess and, uh, for for like so motorcycles and I think biking in general is just really interesting because you have this consumer that is obsessed or like idolizes Harley Davidson. It's like a really specific image. Yes. Um, how has that been difficult to kind of well, reshape people's? Well, that's the thing. We're not trying to reshape it, and that's the the whole point of it. Is like how do we create something that is uniquely ours and just let people come to us and that's been working so far you know and all of that comes with then branding what's your voice are you staying true to your voice are you doing what you believe in you know how authentic is it and the more you hone that in the less you have to rely on going out there and convincing people because if, if you if you find yourself in the position where you have to convince someone either you're not talking to the right person or something's wrong on your end. Um, what I've noticed, and I've had a couple of companies prior to this, and I work with branding, and a lot of times a company comes, it's like, I need a new brand, something's not working. You know, another the agency goes and does the whole visual identity positioning, right? And then they present it, and then they're like, oh, I tried it, it still doesn't work. It's about the same thing as I come to you and I ask, tell me who I am. Can you help me tell me who I am? And you come back and, you are this. I'm like, thanks, right? So every company needs to go back to its roots and like, who are we? What are we doing? And make sure that's crystal clear. You know, if it's not, it doesn't matter. Nobody is going to be able to help you. Maybe short term, maybe you're going to be able to get some sales. But in the long term, if you want to build a long term business, like back to basics, why are you doing this? Uh, Have you had converts from, you know, Harley guys. Oh yeah. We've had, uh, we started doing test rides. So if anyone's want to, uh, ride an electric motorcycle in Brooklyn, um, let us know Saturdays, <laughs> um, you need a license, but we had a bunch of, uh, Harley guys, you know, goatees and leather jackets and the whole thing show up and super skeptical. the skeptical. They look at the bike, like, what is this thing? And initially I tried to convince them. I'm like, it's electric, it's faster, it's zero emission, <laughs> you know? And, uh, now I'm like, you want to go for a ride and they go for a ride. Almost every person comes back is like, oh shit, what the fuck? And you know, and they start looking around and they look at their Harley and they look at our bike like, all right, all right. And so that was enough. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to go to a creative marketing campaign, you know, like instead of a Harley and <laughs> buy a tar phone. It's so chat for you, the consumer, are they usually just unaware? Um, and then you're educating them and they're like, oh, this makes perfect sense. Yeah, uh, we think maybe one in four gardeners knows about Beat, and I think once many, once many of them, when many of them learn about the issues with Pete, it's really hard to go back and buy Miracle Grow. So it kind of helps with the loyalty and retention to also tell that story. Um, what do you guys? Can you just opine on like next big opportunity since you're in the space, and um, I'm sure you know other founders in the space. Yeah. Um, I, so I got totally obsessed with biochar, but I also got pretty obsessed with kelp. And so if I hadn't have started a biochar startup, I would have probably started a kelp startup. And what's nice about kelp? Um, you can farm it with almost no inputs and you can grow it in certain ways that actually sequesters carbon as well. Basically it like sinks plankton and plankton are made of carbon. Um, but yeah, it's a super nutritious, um, you know, high quality crop that needs almost no input. You can just grow it out in the middle of the ocean. Rosy kelp. Sounds we good. actually are putting some kelp in the soil just because I'm dying the kelp. <laughs> uh, Daniel, what do you think? Well, Chad stole my idea, so uh, yeah, now I need, I need another answer. Um, no, I think anything so is- Kelp is hot right now. Kelp is pretty hot. Kelp also, uh, it sequesters carbon, but it also helps filter like seawater. Um, and so I think anything in the kind of water treatment clean water, drinkable water, potable water kind of space is going to be a big hot button topic over the next probably decade or so. You know, and I think anything that, any business or service or technology that operates within that realm, um, and in, in addition on the kind of microplastics and 
um, seafood supply chain side of things um, is is what we see a lot of right now. Um, whether that be people who are making tuna in kind of petri dishes and or people who are trying to more sustainably farm and source kind of commonly consumed seafood and things of that nature. Because um, I do think even though we are a plant-based heavy fund, um, seafood seems to be the kind of like final frontier of when people draw the line from a dietary perspective. Um, and so I, I don't know whether it's because people can't really seem to anthropomorphize fish as much or shellfish as much, um, but it is also one of the least sustainable supply chains for a lot of different species of fish and seafood. Um, and so I think that's something that we see particularly because it spans both sides. There's the there's the, for lack of a better word, upstream stuff of the supply chain. And then there's the downstream stuff from a consumer perspective. Um, so, yeah. Taris? Plants for sure. Uh, bio design, bio mimicry, bio engineering, anything bio. Finding a way for the cold tech world to get closer to nature and find that overlap. And uh, just harnessing, you know, the intelligence that's been here for quite a while. If we just look a little closer, right? <laughs> I think it, it, it has a lot of answers that uh, we have chosen not to uh, pay attention to. But now we have the tools, so we can at least understand what I'm talking about is nature, <laughs> how nature operates, and try to unlock its secrets and wisdom and then incorporate it into our iPhones and uh, electric cars. And yeah, I agree with that. I think like there are a lot of... Uh, overlooked categories where there's really big opportunity. Um, Daniel, this is back to, back to you and I sort, you sort of kind of answered this with the last one. If there's anything else you want to add. Yep. Um, and I think, yeah, what's your investment criteria when you look at a startup? So we operate mainly on the seed to early growth side of things. Um, in which case, generally speaking, the first and foremost focus that we have is on the jockey, not the horse, so to speak. Um, so we're very founder focused particularly also in our case, because we get heavily involved in the operations day to day with these businesses, it's really important to us that the founder kind of checks the boxes. Um, usually that's, you know, some sense of kind of coachability, stubbornness, a little, you know, one or two screws loose in a good way. Um, we want that energy, we want that focus, that fire, that drive, right? Um, but we also want people who know what they don't know and want to learn and want mentorship um, and are seeking out those moments uh, throughout their journey as an entrepreneur. Um, and then, yeah, I touched on it a little bit, but there's got to be product market fit. Typically, we only get involved if there's already existing revenue um, and proof of concept and traction from a sales perspective. Um, occasionally, we'll be lenient with that if there's a heavy techno technological advantage or IP component. Um, and then from a business perspective, yeah, there's you know, how big is the market you're playing in? Is the business sustainably built already, even if subscale? How much would scale affect that sort of build of the business from a P&L perspective? Um, what are the unique economics? Who's your consumer? Um, and just getting a full understanding of sort of what makes this company tick and what where are the, where are the places that we can help it succeed and help it be better? Um, and ultimately, where do we see it heading over the next three, five, seven years? Because as venture investors, we're holding, you know, we're investing in a company and then we're along for the ride for seven to 10 years on average, right? Um, and so it's a journey for us as well. And, and it's just about being confident right now that, that, that there are the underpinnings of something that can be very successful um, later on, right? So for the two founders in the room, if you could relaunch your own business, what would you do differently? I, uh, so I'm a solo founder um, and I wanted to have a co-founder, but just never kind of met that person. Um, and I think uh, there's pros and cons with being a solo founder or having a co-founder, but it definitely, I think in the early days before you start to really build a team, it's just like lonely and you feel like you're crazy half the time. So, um, I think I would probably, I would have loved to have found someone to do it with, but just did it. Yeah. Maybe Rosie Kelp. <laughs> Go <laughs> Yeah. You and Daniel. <laughs> uh, Tara is a solo founder as well, right? Uh, no, I have a co-founder, but we went 
Now keep him away. Uh, We're separated. Keep him <laughs> um, mm-hmm. hmm, tough question. There's probably too many things to say, to be honest. I haven't uh, done an honest self-assessment of what that would be. Main thing, you could, you could do one thing over. One thing. Yeah, I would say uh, focus, kind of balance creativity with just basic business practices more, you know, which I think is a very normal thing for most creatives. Like we're typically like, ah, business, that's kind of gross. That's not for me, right? Until it becomes the thing that you need to understand. And if, if you got MBA, that's a different scenario. Maybe you should adjust your creativity knob a little bit. <laughs> but if you come from the creative industry, maybe find a better balance between sort of, you know, knowing how to make p and and what uh, profit margins and the basics of, uh, you know, selling stuff is. Okay, cool. Great, great stuff. A lot of fun. Open Q&A for whoever wants to go first. How far into his business did he make his first hire? We, I started selling soil on a Shopify site, like well before incorporating the business, um, just to see if people would buy it. So I probably spent six months just kind of tinkering in my kitchen, trying to, yeah, see if there was a market for it then incorporated and then raised our first round of capital and then hired someone. So it was, it was probably, it was about six months after incorporation, but probably a year into driving revenue. And that was the soil person because I was way out of my element trying to create great soil. I remember that actually. Um, okay. I remember that actually you were running ads and you were like, I have an 8X row ass on the, on the soil products. Yeah, yeah. I basically put, I think, maybe three grand of my own money into it and sold like probably 60 grand of soil and said, okay, it's time to quit my job and really do this thing. Nice. Other questions? Go ahead. I'm going to pass my mic to you. Hi, I'm Tiana. Um, I'm kind of just wondering, how do you navigate, you know, having a sustainable brand and come from the UA pricing for consumers? You know, when you look at the store, you kind of choose based on the price for a lot of the So how do you kind of navigate that? Should I? Um, yeah, I, I don't believe that consumers will pay a green premium, at least at scale. Like maybe, you know, 5% of your like super whole food shoppers might. But if you want to have real impacts, you need to kind of get out of that super early adopter. So we are a more premium soil, but I believe it's a performance premium. And that allows us to invest more deeply into higher quality inputs that are better for the plants and better for the planet. So I think it's coupled, but um, yeah, I'm not I'm not convinced that a green premium is a scalable thing to do. I, yeah, I would just add that the um, when you're thinking about pricing, you shouldn't be you shouldn't you should be pricing something such that you can make sure that you're making appropriate margin for your business to operate sustainably, and so. To his point, if there's another reason to charge someone a premium, whether it's performance based, whether the, the whole set is a more premium set, um, I would focus on that. But ultimately, you know, if if you if you think your pricing is going to be too outside of that competitive range, then it might be time to go back to the drawing board on the on the cost side of things and see if you can bring down one or two components so that you can make sure you're competitively priced while without sacrificing too much on the quality or the function or anything of that nature. Um, but at the end of the day, you don't want to get into a position where you're priced too far out of range and you're trying to say that it's a green premium and consumers are just kind of walking by it. Right. Are there questions? Go ahead. I'm going to pass this over to you. Hey there, my name is Jonathan. So I would like to know more about how do you sell like motorcycles on Shopify? Like, yeah, no, yeah, like, how does it work that do you have a point of sale uh, in your, um, you know, store or how do you call it? That's it. Yeah, we, we do sell them online, but not through Shopify. I, I told Tavis about this. I tried to, I tried to get you on Shopify. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like an Ikea. It's a $30,000 Ikea. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We build them in Brooklyn, uh, but uh, we, uh, yeah, we do direct consumer. So from the moment someone finds out about us until we give them the keys, we do it all in-house. Uh, maybe in the future, we're going to rely on a dealership uh, model of some sorts. But for now, pretty much how you would find any e-consumer a product, you know, find on Instagram, Google features, whatnot, go to a website and uh, do the rest. I'm gonna give me a better answer than Tara's. Search uh, Tarform on Instagram. 
they've he's done a fantastic job of just like generating demand showing the product and then he gets pre-orders because people walk bike right if it would be that simple <laughs> just build something and sell it that's pretty much <laughs> that's how you other questions well thanks I, I had a question for Taurus. i was curious um how do you go through the design process of um, deciding on your handlebar grip for, for your motorcycle if you did if you didn't study any of your competitors. And I, I was looking at your um, Instagram, it looks like you decided on like a um, diamond pattern. Is, is that correct? A diamond pattern for what, sorry? Your, your handlebar grip, the grip for your uh, motorcycle. Oh, handlebar. interesting detail. What do you do, sir? Why well, I uh, designed a, uh, a push-up handle. So it's called the Ab Shield Boss. So I have, it's like a, you know, it's, it's kind of similar like a grip, you know, so it's. Got it, okay. Well, do you have 14 hours? Um, I can run you through the whole yeah, no, that, workflow of how this operates. That, that, that'd um, be great. I'd, I'd be curious to know. No, seriously, if you're interested, you can stop by our shop at, uh, at the Navy Yard. Everything from prototyping to like the final product. Um, I guess you need to know what you're doing before, right? So you need to understand design, engineering. Uh, for sure, there was an inspiration board. Like this is kind of the, uh, you know, the aesthetic universe we went into. But there were no motorcycles on that vision board. Um, there were more like product design influences that we wanted to draw upon from a different dimension, uh, which I think for any designer is interesting because usually we, like if you're going to design a car, you look at other cars. Your product ends up looking like other cars. If you design a chair, you know most people have other chairs. So I think it's useful to look outside of your industry completely and draw inspiration from that. And that's going to create something unique, something people are like, oh, I've never seen that line, or I've never seen that texture, the material, whatever, in that specific setting. And our handlebars is an example of that. The, the way we designed the handlebars, uh, no other motorcycle handlebar looks like this. Uh, it, this one looks more like, I don't know, Art Deco, Space Age, sort of sci-fi uh, kind of thing, which now became kind of one of the signature looks on the bike. Uh, so thanks for noticing. Like, uh, this question for you, um, you opened, uh, 800 stores in two years. It's quite a bit. So I wanted to just understand from your perspective, the challenges going from D2C, testing it out and then managing the velocity of each of those stores, because while retail is a great free visual, yeah. you still have to show velocity. Otherwise they shut you down. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we kind of went with the traditional CPG route, which was try to prove it in a bunch of small, natural kind of high-end stores before trying to scale up. And so for us, that was all the trendy kind of plant shops in Brooklyn and in Chicago and Denver. And I basically was just flying around the country, hanging out in plant shops, which was awesome. And what that allowed us to do is basically launch hundreds of times and get better and better and better about what it took to get the velocity to stay on shelf. It's actually, it's, you're right. It's much easier to get on shelf than it is to stay on shelf because you're competing basically for the dollars of that real estate and that, that retail business needs to prove that you deserve that spot. And, and so for us, it meant a bunch of iterations on price point, a bunch of iterations on packaging, trying to get better about staff education and placement and making sure they were telling the story correctly. Um, and also trying to figure out, you know, which stores we did best in and why. Um, we also got super lucky in that about half of our doors have been inbound, like have just ordered sight unseen because there's just not much like this in the category. And then we got really, really lucky because our, the target buyer, cold emailed us, like just filled out our website form two months into our launch and we got to launch Target because of that. So um, I don't know, there's a, a little bit of hard work and a lot of luck, I think. Hi, my name is Ashley. Um, I have a question, I think it's across the board though. For, uh, to be a sustainable business, uh, sometimes you have, you know, byproduct left over. Um, and then you also have packaging that goes into play. With that in mind, what challenges or systems did you put in place for the consumer on the other end and as well as for yourself for it being manufactured? Yeah, great question. Um, so I accidentally printed 10,000 bags of our houseplant mix with our cactus illustration on it. 
and I don't know what to do with those bags. So if anyone has any ideas, please. But yes, you're right. Like this shit happens basically. Um, from the consumer perspective, we try to make it as easy as possible to know what to do when you're done with the product, to reuse the packaging how you can. We set up refill stations at our retailers um, and then to try to make it easy to recycle when you have to um, you know, get, get rid of the packaging and the rest of the product. Um, and that actually factored into, we've done a full life cycle assessment of the product, which basically says, here's the net emissions from cradle to grave of this product. And part of that math is what our consumers do at the end. So we're actually incentivized from that measurement to try to help people do the right thing with the product. And it'll, you know, be continuously iterated to try to get there. Yeah. I think, um, I think, yeah, what he's doing at Rosie is typical for what you would see from a CPG that's trying to be sustainable from a packaging and consumer kind of interaction perspective. Um, you know, we have a company in the portfolio called Holier, which is a in the vitamin, minerals, and supplements arena. Um, and they have a multivitamin that's sort of curated to be specialized for people who live a plant forward sort of lifestyle from a diet perspective. And um, instead of shipping in kind of a plastic, typical like vitamin container that you'd see, it's a glass container. So it's a little bit more expensive to ship. Um, but then you get refill pouches that are compostable to refill the glass jar. Um, and consumers seem to really love that added kind of thoughtfulness uh, that comes with the product. Um, and from a, you know, from a cost perspective, it's, it's a little bit more expensive than a plastic tub, but at the end of the day, it creates a much longer lifetime value from a consumer um, that it's worth every penny to do things like that. Um, so similar to his refill, refill stations and um, other sorts of, any way that you can create a unique touch point with the consumer that seems very well thought out and, and well designed and kind of curated for their wants and needs, um, you're going to have them there for a long time. So that's, that's how I would think about it.